I'm going to tell you a story about the American chestnut tree. But first, I want to begin by acknowledging that NC State sits on land that was originally stewarded by two indigenous tribes, the Tuscarora and Catawba tribes. Their descendants live throughout North Carolina today and contribute to the rich diversity that our state embodies. As we think about complex, wicked natural resource issues, we should also think intentionally about the complex human histories that intertwine with histories of the land. North American tribes once referred to the American chestnut tree as the grandfather of the forest. It was a dominant feature of the eastern forests here in the United States, thanks in part to tribal land management. The chestnut accounted for one out of four trees in its range and could live for upwards of 600 years. You might guess from the size and dominance of the chestnut that it was once known as a keystone species throughout its native range, providing habitat and a critical food source for a number of important wildlife species that were, in turn, food sources for tribal communities. The nuts themselves were also an important food source, particularly when food supplies were otherwise scarce and chestnut recipes abound in both tribal histories and early colonial histories. In addition to being an important food source, the chestnut also provided medicine and shelter for the tribal communities and was so important that according to an article by Suzette Brewer in Indian Country Today, the chestnut emerges in stories and legends from every native linguistic group east of the Mississippi. These giants were also important to the European settlers, again, providing food, shelter, tools, and other products. The chestnut became known as the cradle to grave tree because it, products made from its wood, such as houses, fences, and of course, cradles and coffins, were known to last well beyond a single lifetime. In the early 20th century, an invasive fungal pathogen was accidentally imported by way of a New York nursery, quietly and then devastatingly taking hold of the chestnut population. By the middle of the 20th century, billions of trees have been lost. The loss of the chestnut was devastating to the ecosystems and communities that depended on it. And folks living in its range looked out at landscapes like this and thought their whole world was dying. The blight decimated the chestnut, but didn't eliminate it altogether. The tree is now functionally extinct, which means its population no longer plays a meaningful role in the ecosystem and that it is no longer a viable reproducing population. The blight cuts off the tree at its root collar but every few years, it will send sprouts like this, trying to hold on to life. The chestnut blight proved to be impossible to eliminate, and despite decades of work breeding and treating and inoculating, the blight persisted. In the early 1990s, the New York State chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation approached a research team at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry about exploring the potential for using new, then, and emerging tools of genetic engineering to restore the much beloved tree. After years of work, the team successfully developed a genetically engineered, blight-tolerant American chestnut tree. This tree is currently under regulatory review, and if it passes that review, it will likely be the first genetically engineered organism to spread freely in unmanaged environments. This is incredibly exciting for so many people, mostly of European descent, who have been working on restoration for decades and decades. Yet, others are deeply troubled by the prospect of a genetically engineered organism that can breed and grow in shared environments. Many indigenous peoples around the world, in fact, believe that genetic engineering is a threat to their sovereignty. Here in the United States, there are indeed over 300 tribal reservations, most of which are governed by sovereign tribal governments. One of the big questions here is what we should do about this genetically engineered tree that has the potential to cross sovereign tribal boundaries. However, if we want to parse out what sovereignty actually means, it can get a little more complicated than just the potential for a genetically engineered chestnut tree to cross sovereign borders. If sovereignty refers to the right to self-govern, then in this context, it actually needs to account for the rights of tribal communities to live within their own worldviews. And that worldview gets even more complicated when you think about traditional lands, which extend well beyond existing reservation territory. One way to think about how the complicated relationship between the sovereign right to govern and the potential restoration of the American chestnut tree using a genetically engineered organism 
is through the lens of something called reciprocal restoration. Reciprocal restoration can mean different things to different scholars, but here we see a list of dimensions that Dr. Robin Wall Kemmerer suggests we consider. One of the big challenges here is that the time of chestnut loss roughly coincided with a dark chapter in American history, the Indian boarding schools, where indigenous children were taken away from their parents in an attempt to assimilate remaining tribal nations. This meant that generations of children were prevented from learning their language, cultural knowledge, and practice. While the chestnut was dying in the forests, traditional ecological knowledge about the chestnut was dying off too. Any attempt to restore traditional chestnut practices in tribal communities throughout the chestnut range requires restoration of both the trees themselves and the cultural practices that went with them. Fortunately, efforts to restore both are underway. In addition to the exciting genetic work happening around the chestnut, there are indigenous language and cultural revitalization efforts happening all over the world, including in the tribal communities in the Chestnuts Range. Even more interesting, because of the genetic engineering dimension, some indigenous environmental leaders are calling the chestnut a new tree rather than a restored tree, and are saying that perhaps this new tree will generate new stories and new cultural practices. The world is always changing, and as we seek solutions to address some of the wicked problems facing our planet, we also want to think about what new stories these solutions are growing.